Luke chapter 1. We heard in our series last week, uh, we're calling our, our series Best Christmas Ever, and uh, where we are trying to take a look at the Christmas story with fresh eyes, uh, that we can hear it with fresh ears as if we're hearing it for the first time, and allow it to, to speak to us. And uh, we want to take that, because it becomes so familiar, but because the holiday season, the Christmas season, becomes so encumbered by all the other trappings uh, of our culture and our traditions, we want to be able to allow the, the season to speak to us and the story to speak to us. But uh, we talked about last week that so many times we try to present an image of ourselves and of our families, especially on social media, uh, where everything is perfect. And we brought, brought my Instagram frame back again. Uh, you guys need to uh, need some more pictures. You guys need to take some pictures with it. Rudy and Lauren, I know you guys like taking pictures, uh, so we need some pictures. Uh, you can post them on Facebook or on our page and, and make sure you tag Orchard Church in there and stuff. But we try to present a picture uh, of our lives where, where everything looks good. And every once in a while, we'll post something online that, you know, like, maybe we failed at this one, you know, worst dad ever, you know, whatever it may be, left my kid outside in the snow, no clothes on, you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, but generally, we try to present a picture of ourselves that is perfect. We, we, we'll take selfies or we'll take pictures, and we'll take multiple attempts at the pictures to get it looking the best that we can. And then we have the wonderful things on Instagram called filters, right? You guys have experienced this. Filters make everything look better, right? And, and we, so we go through and we so that we can present our best selves uh, to our family and to our friends, when outside of the frame, all that we've cropped out is all sometimes the chaos and the mess that is in our lives. And, and so what we talked about last week is that it's often in the chaos and the mess where God meets us. That as much as we want to present that we have it all together, it's when we are ready to, to maybe admit or, or surrender that the chaos and mess is where we live, that, that, that God meets us there, that God is not absent in this place. And we talked about Mary last week and how the announcement from Gabriel absolutely would have turned her world upside down. And, and we think about Mary and, and, you know, we hold her in this high esteem for being uh, the earthly mother of Jesus, but at the same time, this news from Gabriel would have turned her world upside down and shaking her life to the core. But yet that's where she encountered God. And so in the same way, we encounter God there as well. And so... Uh, this got me thinking about this week's message. And uh, how many of you are Hallmark Channel Countdown to Christmas fans? Wait a minute. That's a few of you, okay? A couple of you went really fast up there. I won't mention anyone in the front row who seems to be the guy that enjoys those movies, but uh, that's okay. Uh, so I, I was going through. We don't have a Hallmark Channel personally, uh, but I was going through, and I know, like, I, know, I have friends on, uh, who I know, I see it on Facebook, like, I guess the the rotation of movies comes out like October, and I know people that wait to see what movies are coming out in October, so they can get excited over the next month for these movies to come out on the Hallmark Channel. And, and, and these movies are, I don't know, I, w I went looking last night at some of the movies that were on there. So let, let me give you a sample of these. Uh, Christmas Next Door, has this one been on yet? Anyone? 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 Okay, that, that, so, okay, that's one. Here's, here's another one. Christmas in the Homestead. Okay, start to see a theme here. Okay, here's another one, Sharing Christmas. I think those are the same two actors as the first one as well. Uh, I'm not sure. I was trying to look at that really closely. The woman looks the same. The actress looks very much the same. And, and both. But here, let me give you a summation of what I've kind of gathered from reading some of the synopsis online. Uh, there, there is a, uh, a single attractive woman who uh, is uh, without a romantic interest at Christmas time, uh, who goes about her life in her uh, quaint uh, small town that she is in, and then she meets some angelic sort of being uh, who tells her that, you know, appears and says everything is going to be all right. And then somewhere along the line, she meets some rugged, uh, handsome looking guy, quite like myself or like Rudy, uh, you know. Meets someone like us, uh, and, and it's always the strange, like the guy in the movie is often like an artesian, like they are, they are a sculptor out of wood with chainsaws, uh, but yet they have a six-bedroom house and drive a Hummer. You know, they're, they're really, it's, they're kind of jobless in a sense. They're an artist, but they have lots of money somehow. Uh, and somehow there is a crisis moment in here in the relationship, and then on Christmas Eve, on Christmas Eve, Love is restored and found. Marriages happen. Proposals come. Love flies. And it's a wonderful Christmas. 
So I just told you every movie that's coming up over the next 15 days. You don't need to spend your time watching the Hallmark Channel over the next 15 days and leading up there. But that is kind of the summation. And, and we watch those movies, and sometimes we can watch those and, like, you know, it's, it's a bit of an escape, right? We, that's why we watch movies. You're like, oh, I wish my life was like that. You know, I uh, wish I would find a handsome, rugged man or an attractive woman or whatever it may be. And we think those things or my family would come together. I wish our town was as quaint and beautiful as that. But I think those things. But instead, I think what often happens is that our, our life ends up looking more like this. <clears throat> we wonder, like, where is our kids? Uh, we've, we've been in Walmart for two hours, and I don't know that I've seen my kids for the last 45 minutes. Like, where did they go? We bring them to Walmart. Uh, Malachi, where are your clothes at? Like, I'm just not really sure. But then, then if we're really honest, if we're really honest here, our life can maybe look more like this. And if you've watched Christmas Vacation, as I surmise most of you have, and you know Cousin Eddie, and certainly you know the scene there, and I can't really go beyond that uh, for this time. But in reality, sometimes this is more what our life feels like, as opposed to those first three movies. Right? Our life doesn't always resolve on Christmas Eve all nice and neatly, where we go into Christmas morning just feeling refreshed and new love in our life, new interest, new, new passion, whatever it may be. And sometimes it feels like our, <clears throat> our life or our family relationship is just kind of going down the gutter. And so what do we do then? Like, how do we have the best Christmas ever? How do we live a life then that, that moves, us, moves us forward? And how do we uh, crop out you know, this tendency? We crop out the messy parts of our lives. But yet this is the place where God often meets us. Like, this is the place here where God often meets us. We're, we're ready to say things are going down the tubes, and I need Jesus, and I need God. And this is the time where we stop cropping out the mess, and we accept where we are with God. So this morning, I want to take a look at the character, the person of Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, but mostly we're going to focus on Zechariah today, uh, from the Christmas story. Zechariah would be the uncle of Jesus. Uh, Elizabeth was Mary's sister, so they would be aunts. And uh, let me read for us and, and start together uh, Zechariah, or Luke chapter 1, verse 5. And it's not going to be on the screen, so you'll just have to either listen or keep looking at Cousin Eddie there, because he's a fine, strapping man. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth, who was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. And one day Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and to burn incense. When the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was inside the sanctuary, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord, their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure that this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. <clears throat> then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God, and it was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you don't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the, this child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So here, let me, let me recap the story and kind of bring it in, into us uh, together today. Zechariah was a priest. And it says that he belonged to the family or the priestly line of Abijah. And this meant that as a priest, he had his appointed day and appointed week to go to the temple. And, and while his company of priests would gather at the temple, they would cast lots to see who would go inside uh, the temple and to burn incense. And so it was, in essence, one hand, it looked to be by chance, but certainly we figure out as we read through there, that there's nothing by chance, that it is all in the hands of God, 
that God ordained that Zechariah would go into the temple on this particular day. And so it's Zechariah in this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go inside the temple, to burn the incense on the incense altar, and to pray in that spot, awaiting the presence of God. Now, it also says, Luke also tells us, that Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother and the first priest in the Jewish faith and Jewish tradition. And so this meant, in essence, that both Zechariah and Elizabeth, what Luke is telling us, they're both from priestly line, is that they're really righteous people. They're good people. And, and they follow the law. In fact, if, if they were here in Delaware today, we'd say them's good people. You know, uh, they're, they're good people right there. And, and they, are, they are above reproach. They are above, uh, you know, questioning. They are righteous in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man. They're good people. And except there's this one thing hanging over them, is that Zechariah and Elizabeth were unable to have children. And, and you have to think, and kind of reading between the lines, that certainly they wanted children. Culturally, that the would have been the expectation. And at this point in time in, in, in the world, and certainly this wasn't that long ago that some of these feelings changed, is that it would have been seen as a curse from God, that they had done something wrong, sinful, that prevented them from having children. And, and so we read that they are both older in age now, and being older in age that perhaps they have tried a long time, and that they had no success. And so on one hand, the, the Instagram frame of their life would be that they have it all together, that they're this priestly line, that they come from the top quality uh, pedigree, family-wise, in Israel. And yet outside the frame, the mess, the chaos in their life is perhaps this longing, this desire that they've had for many years to have a family and to have children and never being able to conceive. And so uh, as a priest, it came time for Zechariah's company to come uh, and minister at the temple. They, they essentially threw dice uh, to figure out who is going to go into the temple or maybe they drew straws or whatever it was. Zechariah's turn. Uh, is chosen, he goes into the temple. Uh, I like to think maybe they played rock, paper, scissors too, but I don't know. It's kind of a little more fun than just dice and straws. But they, uh, Zechariah went in, and as he burns incense the, that represent the prayers of the people, uh, Zechariah goes in in this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. While he's inside, he encounters the angel Gabriel. He encounters this angel at the side of the altar, and just like every other angelic occurrence and, and encounter throughout the Bible, the first words of the angel are, do not be afraid. Because you have to think it would be terrifying. You know, and, and people always wonder, like, what the angels look like. And you, you see the image on, you know, all paintings and artwork. And there's these cute little cherubs and, you know, nice little angels with blonde hair and white robes. And, you know, kind of the type of angels that probably Gabe could take in a wrestling match. You know, something like that. They don't look all that strong. But, like, these guys are terrified. To the point that someone has to say, the angel has to say, do not be afraid. And so the angel says that, and Zechariah encounters this angel. This was the same angel that would appear, appear to Mary in the story that just comes after this that we talked about last week. And so Zechariah, in this encounter, he thinks that perhaps he's just going to burn incense. He's going to stand there and offer a few prayers and go home. Maybe the same perception that we have sometimes of going to church. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to sing a couple songs. I hope they don't sing that song because I don't particularly like that song. You know, Pastor Steve doesn't talk too long, and, and we go home. But maybe our expectation level of that worship experience is low. And we don't know what Zechariah's was. But he walks into that temple. And, and it must have been a surprise for him. And he says, do not be afraid, Zechariah. And listen to this. Your prayers have been heard. And think about Zechariah here and his, and his wife, Elizabeth. That for all their married life together, they have been praying for a child. And their prayer, and, and, and praying and wondering and not being able to conceive and, and seeing all their friends around them having children and, and people asking them, like, you know, in their, in their early 20s or mid-20s, they've already been married for a few years, and like, well, when are you guys going to have children? Grandma comes around and like, is there any bun in the oven, Elizabeth? You know, all these things that people say, well-intending, but can be also very hurtful for someone that's struggling to conceive. And Zechariah and Elizabeth do their best to keep their hopes up, and they pray, and they pray, and they pray, and at some point they realize that biology and the clock has not just stopped, you know, slowed down and ticking, but it's ticking altogether for them. 
And perhaps maybe they've made their peace with God about it, but at the same time, there's this longing, this emptiness inside of them. And the first thing the angel says is, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been heard. And I wonder what that must have felt like for Zechariah, for someone that had prayed for something, one thing, solitary for so long, to hear that God heard his prayers. Because you and I, when we pray, you know, if we don't hear an answer to prayer, sometimes we, we can be led to think or we're tempted to believe that God doesn't hear our prayers. And the first thing that God reminds him is that your prayers have been heard. So Zechariah, or Gabriel, identifies himself who he is and tells Zechariah that he and his wife will conceive, even in their older age, that their prayers have been answered. I think about this, about what would have been my response to this situation. How would you respond uh, that, that Zechariah, he, he, he's older in years, and you know, Luke kind of says his wife's getting along in years too. I, I wonder how delicately Luke had to write that uh, for the women in his life that would read that. But, you know, the, he, the indicate that, and Luke's a doctor, so Luke gets this. Like, he understands the biology that goes on here, that at a certain age, children just don't happen. And he shares this story and what Zechariah's response must have been. And, and, and listen to this. Zechariah asked for a sign. He asked for a sign. Here he is standing inside the temple, standing at the incense altar, standing in front of the, you know, in essence, where the prayers go up in the very place where the embodiment of the presence of God was believed to have been. And an angel is standing before him, and he's like, uh, can you give me a sign? Uh, how am I going to be sure that this is really going to happen? And I think I'm like that, too. I think there's many times where I see something that's pretty obvious that I need to do, that I have my own doubts or my own questions and, and, and a lacking of faith where I want God to confirm and affirm it again, what's going to happen? Zechariah has an angel standing before him. And so rather than a sign, what I think happens here is that God wants us to step out in faith even when it seems impossible. That we are to trust God even when it seems impossible. So we're not necessarily to just ask for a sign when God tells us to do something or God reveals to us what the next step is or where it is that God is taking us in life. And so Zechariah, he's lacking faith here. And certainly he, he believes in God. He worships God. He goes to temple every day. Uh, he ministers in the temple, maybe even leads a small group, maybe sits on the lead team or whatever, council, finance council. He is involved in the temple. He believes in God. But he's still lacking faith. He wants assurance. He wants a sign rather than just taking the angel Gabriel's at his word. And so when faced with the impossible, conceiving a child at an old age, Zechariah wants a sign. Now think back to what we talked about last week in the story of Mary. Mary as a young woman, 13, 14 years old, betrothed to Joseph, has this angelic encounter with Gabriel who tells her that she's going to conceive a child, and she's like, well, how's this going to happen? I'm a virgin. This, you know, I know how things work, too. I've watched TV and MTV, and they tell me on there. And, and she's like, how's this going to happen? And the angel really doesn't give her much. Like, the Holy Spirit's going to over, overshadow you, and he's going to be great and mighty, and Mary's like, that doesn't really help me much. Uh, but here, remember her response? She says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be true. She didn't ask for a sign. She didn't ask for reassurance. And we have this great contrast to what faith looks like. That faith looks like Mary, who doesn't know what the next step is going to be, who had to know that it was going to be rough between her and Joseph when she tells Joseph that she's going to be expecting a child, who, was, who knew it was going to be rough with her parents and his parents when she tried to explain, like, well, I don't know how it happened. Like, God just said it was going to happen. It had to be tough in her community when she started the show and everyone wondered what her and Joseph had been up to or someone else. And yet here Mary says, as a sign of faith, may I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me come true. The author of Hebrews writes that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without the ability to step out and follow when God tells us to go, it's impossible to please God. God. And so we are to trust God even when it seems impossible. We're to trust that God will show us the way. 
then things that are impossible or difficult. But I think it even goes a step further is that the encouragement is that we are to do what is possible and let God take care of the impossible. Like I'm limited on what I can do in my life. I'm limited in my ability to do things. I can't transform things physically, spiritually. I can't do the miraculous. But yet I can do what God calls me to do and allow God to take care of the rest in my life. With Mary, there was nothing Mary could do to bring about her conception. She could only trust God that God was going to take care of it. Even with Zechariah, there was only so much he could do. He knew the biology. He knew the odds. And all he could do was trust God and and Elizabeth as well. There are other examples of the Bible uh, of people who are told to do the impossible, but then do what they can't do and let God take care of the rest. Uh, in, In Luke 17, Jesus encounters 10 lepers, and, and if you remember from, from your Sunday school class with leprosy, the lepers stood outside the city. They were away from their family. They couldn't go with them. They couldn't see their, their children. They couldn't hug anyone or, or play with their kids, and so they stood outside and had to yell, unclean, unclean, until maybe miraculously or, or someday they were healed and they could show themselves to the priest, and so one day these 10 lepers were outside the city gates, and they heard that Jesus was coming, and then they shouted out to Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And they weren't healed yet. He just told them to go. And Luke says that it was on their way that they were healed. On their way. And so when Jesus told the lepers to go, they still had leprosy. But it took faith that the person they were talking to, Jesus, had told them they had faith to go to show themselves to the high priest. That they did what was possible and went to the high priest and allowed God to take care of what was impossible, healing them of the leprosy. In in John chapter 1, certainly is another, uh, John chapter 21 is another example for us. And this is after the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, His disciples have have seen encounters with the resurrected Christ. Uh, But in in what we're seeing in John, uh, Peter and and some of the other disciples who were fishermen have gone back to fishing. Their career, three-year career as disciples and, and itinerant ministers has ended and they are fishing they're doing what they know and as they fish it is late it is early morning they have been fishing all night john tells us they've been fishing all night and they've not caught a thing john nichols i know you fish uh have you fished all night not caught a thing or all day long it's absolutely okay it's not hard to do right like uh but even good fishermen come up empty sometimes and, and so they have caught gone all night, and it's not just for pleasure that they're fishing. It is their business. It is their livelihood. And they, they're close enough to shore that they see someone standing there. They can't recognize them. Perhaps there's fog coming off the sea. And the person on the shore says, throw your nets on the other side. Now, to me, like, if you're one of the fishermen, you've got to be thinking, like, how dumb does this guy think we are? Like, seriously? Like, he wants us to take our nets from over here. We're catching nothing, and toss them over here, right? That's not far for the fish to go. Uh, but yet, John records that the disciples took their net out of the water, tossed it on the other side, and came up with a catch that was too heavy for the boat to catch. The disciples did what was possible. They listened to Jesus. They took their nets and they tossed it on the other side, where it really makes no sense. Like John fishing on a dock and casting to the left and reeling it in and just casting to the right. Like, what do you think it would make that much of a difference? No fish all night long to this record haul that they have. They did what was possible and let God take care of the impossible. Think about this with Rudy and with Lauren and, and hearing what God was doing at Wisdom and Grace Church. Now, if you hear Rudy's story, my, my, he became principal like, after you graduated high school. You took over the school. Can you imagine being 18 and saying, God saying, you're up. You're, the, you're in charge of the school. And Rudy stepped forward, maybe not even knowing how to run a school. But he stepped forward and said, yes. And, and he shared, they briefly shared, you know, 2012, they were thinking about closing the school. And yet they said, one more chance. Let's go connect with some people and some churches. What's the worst that's going to happen? Like, all we can do is, you know, the worst they're going to say is no, and and the best they're going to say is yes. And so they came to America and shared the story, and they shared it with their friends and family. They did what was possible, 
and they're letting God take care of the impossible. Guatemala is a beautiful country, not as affluent as we would say the United States is. Two million dollar building project for a school of a thousand. Massive, massive building project. Where do you start with two million dollar building projects? I can't imagine starting one here, to be completely honest. You start with what's possible. A vision and saying, here's the people we can connect to. We'll walk and share that vision. Because they believe that, that God has laid it on our hearts. They believe it's a God-ordained vision. And it's not their job to see the vision come through. That's God's job. Their job is to be faithful and to say, I'll, I'll step. I'll come to the mountain. I'll go to this church where we know Pastor I'll go to this church where we know Pastor Steve. We'll go to this church here where we know Pastor Steve. We'll trust God to do the impossible in our lives. And I think it highlights for us the, the cycle for us that we go through, that, that at the top of that little graph is, is the impossible, the thing that God calls us to, the difficult things that God calls us to from, from building a $2 million school in, in, in Guatemala, in Central America, to even what sometimes seems impossible of being able to share our faith. Because we have different degrees, we grow in our faith, and God gives us with, entrusts us with what we can do, and grows our faith and gives us bigger and bigger things. That as we encounter the impossible, God calls us to trust and step out in faith. And that as we trust, we learn to obey. That God calls us to take a step of faith, and we obey to do that. And when we obey, when we take that step of faith and trust, then we encounter God's blessing. And that blessing is the spiritual transformation. That blessing is the realization that God actually does come through in his word. That if God's called us to something, that God sees us through it. That if God's called us to the impossible, that God will bring us through that impossible, whatever that impossible may be. And we get up and, and we experience that blessing, but it doesn't stop there. It then cycles through again. Because if we've stepped out in faith in a small thing, then what happens is our faith grows, and God calls us to step out in something else that we might say is impossible. And that when we step out and say, I trust you, God, I'm going to obey and follow and take that step, we encounter the blessings again, and it's a messy step. It's a difficult step. It's a step where we don't always know the answers, but all we see is that next step. And then all that we can do is just take that next step. It's kind of like walking by candlelight at night. A candle doesn't give you a lot of light, right? Or maybe by your cell phone light. And your cell phone light doesn't always give you a lot of light. But all you can is take that next step. And then you've got enough light to see the next step that God illuminates for you. And the power of discipleship, of living as a disciple, is continually taking that next step Trusting and believing that God has our best interest in mind, that God is for us, and obeying the call of God in our heart. Last week we talked about, uh, for those of you who are moms, uh, we've talked about whether the pain of going through and giving birth to a child is worth it. And all but like two or three of you said yes, it's worth it. There, there were a few of you that were still were kind of on the fence about the whole thing and whether the miracle. But it's that same thing that when God calls us to the impossible, it is worth worth just not knowing where you're going to go. And where you're going to go. Because you don't know where you are. You're in the place of unbelief. You don't know where you're going to go. God has a blessing for you in our lives. So this morning, uh, you may be facing something today your heart and mind that you believe is impossible. Maybe it's a, rec- a relationship that needs to be reconciled. Maybe it's a, a secret sin that you've never confessed to God. And you know from your heart of hearts that, that transformation needs to come for you to do it. It could be um, any number of things. It could be the feeling of inadequacy that you have in, in trying to present a life that's all together when really you just don't have it all together. And what God's called you to do is to step out in faith and transform our lives. God calls us to take a step of faith, to put our trust in him, and that God will take care of the impossible. So I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you today. So where's God calling you to walk in the impossible this week? Where's God calling you to walk in faith? Where is God calling you to take a step of faith and to trust One bite at a time. Ask you to allow the impossible to happen in your life for 
God to transform you. song after we close with the song um, we're going to invite you to it could be a relationship it could be a financial situation right now and uh, I've asked Rudy and Lauren to come forward and be willing to pray with you if you desire that you certainly don't have to you can pray on your own uh, but as, as we sing today it may be a step that God you prayed over. And to come and, and to share that time in God's presence today. Because I know that God wants to see the impossible happen. In our lives, but also in media as well. Uh, so let's pray together. God, uh, we come today come acknowledging there are situations and circumstances in our lives that often feel impossible. Look at them, and we say, God, how how can this situation ever change? How can this relationship ever change? How can how can I ever grow in my faith? I feel so inadequate in this area. God, how can it be? How can this even happen? And yet, God, we hear today, and we even feel the the Spirit nudging on our heart that we are that you are calling us to take a step of faith, to go deeper in our faith, to go deeper in our walk with you. To, to see relationships reconciled, to see healing take place, to put ourselves in a position where our faith is able to grow. So God, give us the courage today to take a step. Take a step. Number one, you're not asking us to take a leap. You're not asking us to do the impossible. But take a step to put us in your proximity. Your presence that allows us If you have a situation that you'd like to, to spend time praying, take a step towards the prayer rail. If you'd like Rudy and Lauren to pray with you, uh, there's something powerful about having someone pray with you, over you, to lay hands on you, and, and, and to pray on your behalf. So come and do that. And if you've never received Christ as your Savior, come and pray for that. To experience that transformation of what Jesus did on the cross for us. To put our faith and our trust in him. So let's stand as we go.